So, uh, hello, welcome to, to the last uh, expedition seminar of this semester. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce Alina Oprea. She's an associate professor at the Curie College of Computer Sciences. He leads the, the cybersecurity research team, and today he will talk about resilient collaborative AI in cybersecurity. Alina, the phone is yours. Thanks for coming. Okay, hello everybody, and uh, thank you so much for the introduction, Ricardo. I'm delighted to give a talk today at the uh, uh, Experiential AI Expedition Seminar. So the topic of my talk today uh, is about resilient collaborative AI in cybersecurity. So to motivate my talk, uh, let's look at the landscape of security breaches. Um, so we all read in the news about security breaches all the time. Uh, a famous attack was the RSA breach from 2011, uh, which started a new era of sophisticated cyber attacks. And at the time, um, I was a researcher at RSA Labs, and this breach made me really interested in working in this area, how to, to detect security attacks breaches. So since then, we have seen an evolution of these attacks over time. Uh, more recently, last year, the Colonial Pipeline breach uh, resulted in a shutdown of a gas pipeline in the Northeast for six days. So as we can see, uh, the impact of these cyber attacks is quite high. Uh, they result in financial losses, loss of private sensitive information, and also critical infrastructure threats. So uh, we are in an era where AI is widely used in many settings uh, with a great amount of success, for example, in computer vision, in NLP, natural language processing, medicine, and so on and so forth. Uh, and as security researchers, uh, we are interested if AI can improve cyber defense. And what we would like to achieve with, with AI, what is our wish list? We would like to detect more attacks than existing defenses. Uh, we would like to detect attacks faster with fewer errors and potentially even deploy mitigations against these breaches to prevent uh, the impact. However, uh, there are a number of challenges towards these goals. This is not an easy problem. And some of these challenges were first recognized by a paper by Sommer and Paxson published uh, in 2010. I would like to mention five of these challenges. So the first one um, is the fact that uh, usually in cybersecurity, we have limited ground truths, limited data of malicious activities. And there is a huge data imbalance where the uh, benign activities dominate uh, the training data. Second, the, the security data sets cannot be publicly shared to train machine learning models uh, because they include a lot of sensitive information like user browsing behavior and things like this. Third, uh, cyber data has certain semantics, which is very unique, uh, and existing architectures for neural networks designed for vision or text are not immediately applicable to cyber data. Uh, fourth, there is a high cost of errors uh, in, in cybersecurity compared to other settings. In particular, false positives result in uh, alerts that need to be investigated by a human analyst. And so there is additional time spent in investigation. And false negatives result in breaches that are not discovered on time. So both of them have a pretty high cost. And lastly, um, the AI algorithms themselves might be under attack by adversaries. So we need to design resilient AI methods in cybersecurity. And this is a well-known challenge in adversarial machine learning. So in my group, uh, we work on several areas of research to address some of these challenges. Um, we have several lines of work. The first one is using machine learning and AI for cybersecurity, for example, for threat detection, for detecting cyber attacks, and for collaborative cyber defense. Uh, the second one is on trustworthy AI, 
where we have done a lot of work looking at different attacks against AI and machine learning, uh, in particular poisoning attacks at training time, as well as evasion attacks at testing time. Um, and lastly, we are also interested in privacy uh, offered by AI algorithms. We have developed tools for privacy auditing and have analyzed memorization in large language models. So there is a lot of work going on, um, but today uh, I will focus about uh, on our work on AI, using AI for cyber defense. Uh, and this is uh, work led by my PhD student, Talha Ongun, who is planning to, to graduate in the next year. And this work is funded by uh, the DARPA Chase program, the uh, called cyber hunting at scale. So our goal in this project was to detect and stop self-propagating or SPM malware attacks. So SPMs are attacks that propagate independently on the internet. There are some famous examples, which I'm sure uh, everyone has heard about. Uh, for example, Mirai infected 600,000 IoT devices uh, in 2016 and use them to launch coordinated denial of service attacks. Um, another famous example is the WannaCry ransomware attack, which infected 200,000 machines around the globe in a very short period of time, just a few days. And so the question that we ask is how can we proactively prevent future and more sophisticated self-propagating malware attacks? So when we look at the modern cyber attack, uh, it has a life cycle of multiple stages. Uh, for example, the Mirai attack starts by scanning random IPs on the internet and propagate on multiple ports in order to infect other machines. Um, then the malware is downloaded from the server and regular command and control communication or C2 communication is established between the victim, the infected victim machine and the server. And finally, in later stages of the attack, the malicious activities is performed. In Mirai, that means launching this denial of service attacks. And in WannaCry, uh, it's encrypting the user data to request a ransom. So if we look at the most existing defenses in the literature, they try to detect these later stages of malicious activities, either the denial of service attack or the ransomware encryption phase. But I argue that this is too late, right? If, if we are detecting the attacks at these later stages. So instead, uh, we are interested in detecting the attacks very early on to prevent the spread and to, to prevent the damage. So we will start with the very first stage of the attack, which is scanning and propagation for SPM attacks. And we're gonna do this by analyzing network traffic collected at the border of an organization. And then uh, that's the first part of the talk. For the second part of the talk, I will discuss about detecting command and control communication. Okay, so the first system that uh, I'm gonna talk about is called Portfiler. Uh, it is a system for uh, detecting SPM scanning and propagation at, at, uh, at the enterprise level. So Portfiler uses uh, unsupervised learning methods applied to Zeek connection logs. These are network logs collected at the border of an enterprise network or campus network. So this kind of data is very common and this data is usually collected by most organizations today. And we have collaborated with uh, University of Virginia, UVA, uh, and got access to the border traffic collected at uh, UVA and Virginia Tech campuses. So that's the input data to the system. Uh, then Portfiler stands for Port Level Network Traffic Profiler. And as the name suggests, uh, it profiles the normal activity uh, on each port in order to learn the normal behavior. Uh, this, is, this happens at training time. So we train these models in order to, to learn the normal behavior. And at testing time, at deployment time, uh, we use Portfiler, we use these models to detect and to rank the identified anomalies. And we have introduced a new 
ensemble model, which is resilient against evasion. So we have a paper uh, on Port Filer, which was published at the IEEE Communication and Network Security Conference, CNS, last year. And this is publicly available. We have also released the code. So now I would like to give you a few more details about how the network traffic profiling is performed in our system. So a training time, uh, the input to the system are Zeek connection logs on multiple ports that we are monitoring. Uh, and then we extract a number of features per port. Um, and then we train models to learn the probability distributions of sample per port. Um, so uh, we, we observe that the network traffic is different for each port because we have different protocols, different applications that are running on each port. And so we made a decision to train a model per port rather than a single model for the entire network. And so in terms of the uh, machine learning models that we used, we use two types of unsupervised models. First are density-based models, um, the kernel density estimate or KDE model. And the second is a tree-based model, the isolation forest model. So at testing time, uh, we apply the models uh, on new data, new Z connection logs, uh, and then we generate an anomaly score uh, for each sample based on the probability estimates given by the models. And these anomaly scores can be used for ranking the samples to identify the most suspicious alerts. And this is important for priori prioritization of alerts. Okay, now let's see what type of features we use in port filer. Uh, so this is uh, the input. Um, the table here shows the Z connection logs. It includes several fields about each TCP or UDP connection. For example, the timestamp, the source destination IP, uh, protocol, port, uh, byte sent and received, and so on, duration state. So from this raw data, now uh, we extract a number of statistical features that capture information about various aspects of the network traffic such as, for example, what's the average number of bytes or packets sent per time interval, uh, what are the number of internal and external IPs visited per time window, and the number of failed connections. Um, and these are all features that we define to capture the scanning and the propagation activities of infected machines. So they are driven by our domain expertise. And we also analyzed malware traces to determine that these features are indeed representative for the task that we try to solve. Now, in terms of the machine learning models, uh, as I mentioned, we use a popular density estimation method called KDE, kernel density estimate. The way this works is that it fits a Gaussian on each training sample using a fixed um, variance or bandwidth. And then KD generates a smooth probability estimate by averaging these Gaussians. Now let's see how, how we use this technique, which is a well-known method for density estimation in our system in port five. So at training time, we fit a KDE model to training samples to learn the distribution of traffic for each port. Then we fix false positive rate, which has to be fairly low in cybersecurity, and we determine a threshold per port. A testing time, we consider a sample an anomaly if the density is low below the threshold. And the smaller the density, the higher the anomaly is ranked. So we can use these density scores directly for ranking the anomalies and prioritizing the alert. Now for evaluating our system, we used one week of Z connection logs for training in both networks and one day of data for testing. This is data from September, 2019. Um, and this table shows the volume of logs per day um, in both networks. We can see that there are hundreds of millions of logs per day. So the networks are quite large. UVA is a bit larger than Virginia Tech. In terms of malicious traffic, we used public WannaCry and Mirai traces, uh, which we merge in the testing day. 
We never train on these malware traces, but we use them for testing the detection of our system. Um, in addition to that, our collaborations at UVA also perform attack recreation exercises in which they run live malware on the two networks, and we test if our models can detect that. So let's look at some initial results here. First, in terms of metrics that we use for evaluation, uh, I would argue that in cybersecurity, because of the highly imbalanced setting where malicious data is only a small fraction of benign data, precision recall curves and area under precision recall curve would be uh, a good metric to use uh, instead of the more standard uh, raw curves and the UC metric, which could be very misleading in imbalanced situation. So we settled to, to look at this precision recall curves, right, and area under precision recall curves. So what we show in these two plots are uh, precision recall curves for one cry. Um, for detecting WannaCry on the left and for detecting Mirai on the right. And here we just use a standard of the shelf a KDE model trained on the 35 features that we define. And our observation here is that the results are very good, uh, surprisingly good. We get precision recall AUC above 0.99 for both attacks on all the ports. Right. And so whenever we see results like this, we are a bit suspicious and want to dig further to understand why the results are so good. And it turns out that both of these attacks, these are the public traces, right, they propagate very fast. So one cry contacts on average 1,750 IPs per minute and Mirai contacts 19,000 IPs, right? So, uh, at this propagation rate, it seems like standard anomaly detection methods like KDE perform quite well at detecting the SPM propagation, right? But then the question is if our problem is solved or if there is something else to explore. And so obviously we are not yet done because this would not have been an interesting talk if I were to stop here. Uh, and what is interesting in this case is that of the shelf machine learning models such as KDE are not resilient to evasion as I will show in a minute. And so what can an attacker do to evade you know, our system? Um, in this case, it's a fairly easy strategy. An attacker can simply slow down the malware and reduce the propagation rate. And what I'm showing here are two Disney plots of malicious and background traffic using a slower malware variant. We, we have the WannaCry and Mirai uh, malware, and we make them uh, eight times slower than the original. And in this plot, we show that the malware traffic and the background traffic cannot be easily separated. So it is not immediate that um, standard ML methods will be able to distinguish the two as soon as the malware starts evading the system. So the next question, uh, that we asked in our research is how to increase resilience against evasion. And our main insight here is that instead of just training a single model, let's like say a single KD model, um, instead of that, we're gonna train an ensemble of multiple models. Now we might ask, why is that helpful? Why, should, why do, did we decide to use ensembles? Uh, ensembles is a popular method in machine learning. Uh, they have some nice properties like they reduce variance, uh, they improve generalization, and they also mitigate the bias variance trade-off. Um, it turns out that uh, they are also more resilient against evasion, as I will show. Um, and in general, ensembles are used for supervised learning, but we are proposing here the use of ensembles for anomaly detection which is relatively unexplored in the literature. So how do we build the ensemble? Our ensembles will include um, a model, let's say a KD model or an isolation forest model for each feature that learns the distribution of that feature. And then each model in the ensemble will generate an anomaly score uh, at testing time. Uh, then we need to combine these scores into a final anomaly score. Uh, we have two methods for performing that. 
one is a mean ensemble in which each mother contributes equally to the final score. And the second one is weighted ensemble where we have different weights. And now I would like to, to show results on evaluating the ensemble under evasion when the malware slows down. Uh, and what we plot here in this, in this graph is the precision recall AUC as a function of the evasion rate. This is the how much slower the malware is compared to the original, right? So we start with an evasion rate of one, that's the original one, and we go all the way to 128, which is 128 times slower than the original one. And this graph is for the standard KDE model. And what we see here is that initially the KDE model performs well, as I already mentioned, but as soon as the malware starts to, to slow down, the, the model is not resilient. And especially on on the ports that have a lot of traffic, like 80, 443, the KD model doesn't perform well. Now on the right here, I show the performance of, of the uh, ensemble of KD models. And what we can see here is that ensembles provide improved resilience against evasion. For example, um, uh, the standard KD model has a 0.4 precision recall AUC, for this malware that's 128 times slower than the original, and the ensemble achieves a precision recall AUC above 0.9. Uh, so here we are also comparing the standard KD model with the ensemble method using precision recall curves for an invasive one cry variant. We observe the same thing that ensembles have much higher precision recall AUC than the standard KD models. And the other thing we, we looked at is how well the ensembles perform uh, after ranking the anomalies, right? And we looked here at the top 100 ranked alerts, right? Using these anomaly scores to perform ranking. And what we show in this table is uh, the precision and false positive rate uh, for the top 100 alerts for both the original WannaCry and the slower variant. And what we observe from the table is that precision is fairly high on all the ports and also false positive rate uh, is fairly low. Um, and this is, uh, this is true also for the original variant, but also for the slower variant. So again, this demonstrates the resilience of ensembles against evasion. The results so far that I presented are based on public malware traces to which we applied several evasion strategies. Uh, in addition, our collaborators at UVA ran attack recreation exercises. They deployed live malware on the two networks. And this is closest to a real scenario where malware propagates on the network, but of course it's a controlled environment. They worked with the internal IT team to create security configuration so the malware only propagates to the VM under their control. Uh, they start running a Mirai attack, they infected one VM, patient zero, and then set up a set of 145 vulnerable VMs on both networks. So the malware could only propagate to these VMs. Um, the malware was controlled by a C2 server hosted in the NSF Chameleon cloud. Um, so uh, the traffic, um, the, the C2 traffic would go over the border and then be collected in the C logs. In addition, uh, we also got fine grain labels of malicious traffic at the level of individual connection logs, right? So each connection log was labeled as malicious or benign. And this is very rarely available. Usually it's not available in cybersecurity. So let's see the results of our system in this setting. We, uh, we show here the recall of port filer in blue. These are the blue bars. These are four different days of these attacks. Uh, the precision is very high, so we don't include it on the graph. And we can see that we can, we can detect this attack recreation exercises. Um, we also compared uh, our system to a um, deep learning method based on autoencoders. These are the orange bars in the graph. And we found that this performs what? Well. 
uh, it performs worse than the portfolio system. So that demonstrates the value of having of using the main expertise for defining you know the feature, which is what we did in portfolio. Finally, we deployed uh, our system on the two university networks and we investigated the highly ranked alerts in one week uh, in December 2019. Here we are not using any public malware traces or attack recreation, so we just run the system on the real network using the, the regular traffic. Um, and it's interesting that Portfiler was able to detect uh, more than 70 external IPs that were confirmed as malicious by virus total on both networks. Um, the ones that we, uh, the 29 IPs that we detected at Virginia Tech were, com were confirmed by the SOC as malicious. So we, we were lucky to, to get access to the SOC team at Virginia Tech and they helped us investigate the alert. Uh, um, what did we find? Well. Uh, different types of attacks, as we expected. Um, for example, SSH brute force attacks on port 22, uh, SMB port scanning on 445, HTTP scanning. Um, we even found a Mirai attack on, on port 443. And interestingly, we, we, de we detected a failed WannaCry attack on port 445. Okay, so this concludes the first part of the talk, and this is a good segue to the second part, which is going to be on global cyber defenses. And if there are any questions, like clarification questions or any questions about Portfiler, I would say uh, now it's a good time to, to ask. Yeah, thank you, Alina. We do have one question from Ben Batorski. Ben, would you like to ask your question directly? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I was just curious. So if I'm understanding correctly, the port filer has separate like training and testing for each individual port. Is that right? Yes, yes. And so is there anything that's a, any sort of shared parameters across those models or maybe there's no there's a reason to not do those? No, I, I, the only thing that shared are the, the features, like we, we just defined the, the same set of features, but in terms of hyperparameter, for example, for KDE, the hyperparameter we need to choose is the bandwidth, right? So that is selected for each port. I mean, there is no reason to, to share it. I mean, we do we do a search for the best hyperparameters for each port. Does this answer the question? Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yes, I can thank you. see the chat. So. <laughs> Okay. We do have one more question from uh, Martin Rosa. Martin, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, do you hear me well? Yes, yes. Yeah. Good. I, um, actually, I was wondering how you actually dealt with uh, the fact that there might be uh, activities in your training data when you, when you build your profile of the network, basically. Oh, you mean if there are similar attacks in the training data? Yeah, like for example, there could already be like uh, SSH, yeah. like a uh, brute force, and so on. Like, and how? So, how do you kind do you deal with the fact that the training data that you're building your model on is already probably already contains like attacks, mm. basically that are be similar or not? But uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. That's more about uh, poisoning attacks, right? If your training data already has some attack instances, but they are not labeled, right? They are considered as background traffic. And in this work, we did not consider that, but I have done a lot of work on poisoning attack. And there are several techniques based on sanitization, for example, right? You can look at the training data and try to isolate outliers and not include them as part of your training set. So I have other work on, on poisoning defenses, but this particular system, we have not looked at that. Okay, okay. Well, it's, it, it seems working anyway, but yeah, definitely yeah. interesting. Yeah. Thanks, Anina. Okay, yeah, thanks, Martha. Okay. So um, I can move on to the second part of the talk, which is about uh, global cyber defenses. And by looking at the literature, um, my observation is that most AI systems for cyber defense are trained and deployed locally using data from a single organization. 
So this is true for work from both academia and industry. These are some references on the slide. Uh, the ones in bold are, are my, own, my own work, uh, including Port Pilot, which I just presented. So I think we are missing a, an opportunity here because sharing threat information among defenders should help everyone to detect attacks faster. And there is some sharing that happens today. Uh, I would say today this is done mostly through threat intelligence sharing platforms which are used to disseminate indicators of compromise, such as IP domains, URLs, so on. But there are well-known limitations of these platforms. They become obsolete, these IOCs. They can be easily evaded, right? And I think this is not sufficient for sharing threat information. So the question I will try to answer in the second part of the talk is if we can use defender collaboration to improve cyber defense globally. And referring back to the multi-stage attack life, life cycle, I will now discuss about detecting command and control, C2 communication. This is an important phase in many attack campaigns. This is not specific to STM. And once the victim is compromised, it needs to communicate with the C2 server. And it is common for malware to use the HTTP protocol for this because this is not blocked by firewall. So we will focus on C2 communication detection over HTTP. So the second system I will discuss is called CELEST. This stands for Collaborative Learning for Scalable Threat Detection. Um, th th this system uses federated learning for globally coordinated detection of C2 traffic over HTTP. And the main insight here is to perform knowledge transfer among defenders by training these global models using federated learning. Uh, the paper on, on Celeste is uh, available on Archive. We just released it a few weeks ago. So let's look at the system overview. Uh, we are here using the standard federated averaging uh, training algorithm for training global neural networks for threat detection. And so this is a supervised setting, meaning that the data uh, used for training is labeled. So we use labeled HTTP logs as input. The data comes also from the border of the campus networks as before. Um, now we are using federated learning. I'm, uh, I, I'm hoping most of the, the audience is uh, familiar with the concept, but to give a very brief uh, overview of how that works, right? Federated learning is a distributed uh, training um, algorithm where multiple clients interact with a server in order to train a global model over multiple iterations. And in each iteration, client, uh, clients perform local updates using their own data sets, and then they share the updates with the server, which performs aggregation. And this, this process continues until the model converges. Um, now, the advantage of federated learning compared with a centralized learning is uh, maintaining the privacy of the client data. The data never leaves the client devices, and also the computational overhead is reduced on the server. Now, this is the standard federated learning uh, model. It is used, it has been used successfully in NLP task, in computer vision. Um, and here we are proposing to use this for cybersecurity security for global cyber defense. But uh, we added two novel components to federated learning for, for our use case. So the first, um, it's an embedding representation of URLs, which preserves the semantics of HTTP logs and can also be federated. And the second, it's an active learning component for enhancing the ground truth of malicious activities. So this is the training phase now at testing time, um, each participating client will get the global model and apply it to new HTTP logs, uh, generate scores, and also perform ranking to prioritize the alerts. There is a requirement here that the system works in real time, meaning that we need to generate a score for each HTTP log. 
Now let me talk about the first novel component which we introduced, which is a semantic aware feature representation for HTTP. Uh, the input here is a single HTTP log, and this has multiple fields. The fields are in bold in the slide, like URL, IP port, referrer, so on and so forth. Um, and to represent URLs for machine learning, uh, the standard method, the most common, I would say, method in the literature is to extract some kind of lexical features. We have many examples of lexical features. Now, instead, we take a different approach, and we parse the URLs into tokens, uh, which preserve the structure. And generate then a sequence of tokens, and we treat that as a sentence, which uh, we we use NLP methods to train an embedding of the of the whole URL. And so, uh, in terms of the NLP methods, we use both word to vec and fast text, which are, have similar performance. Um, now here we have to train them from scratch. There is no pre-trained model that would be useful for our setting. Right? Um, and it turns out that the semantics aware feature representation performs better than lexical features we have compared with uh, with existing methods. Um, in addition to that, we have designed a federated protocol for training the embeddings. Uh, and I don't have time to discuss that in more detail, but the important thing is that we can federate this embedding generation process as well. So the final representation of an HTTP log will include embedding features uh, for URL, for, for the referral field, and also a set of categorical features as well as a set of numerical features. Um, now to evaluate the federated model, uh, we have used this federated averaging algorithm implemented in the TensorFlow federated library. Um, and we use HTTP logs from the two networks, UVA and Virginia Tech. Uh, on average, there are about 20 million logs at UVA and 9 million logs at Virginia Tech daily. So the data is fairly large. We applied some filtering techniques to remove the popular um, domains. Um, and we used two clients for our experiments. Uh, UVA and VT, they are two clients, but uh, we have also performed an experiment with multiple clients by separating the data into subnets. In terms of malicious data sets, we use uh, public data sets for IoT malware. Uh, we have used the Mirai and GovKit malware. We have used the next filtration, data exfiltration malware called DEM, and also three attack recreation experiments. So the first question to answer is if the attack knowledge transfers across network. Here we would like to compare the local, the global model with the local models. So we created several scenarios in which we use different malware families in training um, on the two networks, and only one of the networks has the malware of interest in training. And then we evaluate the detection on the other network, right? And as expected, the local models perform um, quite poorly because they have not seen the malware of interest in training. This table here shows the local model precision recall AUC. And the federated model, the global model, has a much higher precision recall AUC uh, in all cases. Um, at the same time, uh, the global model has uh, fairly low false positive rate. Now on the right, we see how training progresses over time. Um, the precision recall AUC increases as we have more iterations, as more data uh, is used for training. And in the bottom graph here, we show precision recall curves comparing the global model with a local model. So clearly the global training helps to detect malware not seen during training at a client uh, and the knowledge is transferred from other participating clients. Now, one of the main challenges, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, is that labeled malicious data is very limited in security. So to address this problem, uh, we propose here an active learning component uh, that we use to select samples for labeling by a human expert. Uh, so we assume a limited budget for investigation in each iteration. And uh, the main question here is how to select samples for investigation. We have two strategies. Uh, one is to select the highly suspicious logs based on the current model. 
And the second is to select the highly ranked anomalies relative to the normal traffic. It turns out that a combination of these two performs best. So, um, uh, so, so let me talk about how to evaluate uh, active learning. So for this, we created a challenging scenario uh, in which we merged the logs from the three malware families in training, but we did not use the labels. They were considered background traffic, right? Uh, and then we used the active learning with a fixed budget per iteration. Uh, at budget of zero, that the system is not using active learning, it's just using the standard federated learning. And what we show in the graph here is the precision recall AUC as a function of the budget. And what happens here is that the anomaly detection model uh, identifies uh, some of these malware as anomalies, and then these are added back to training and the model starts to learn them. And uh, over time, the precision recall AUC would increase. And also as the budget for investigation is higher, the precision recall AUC increases. And it reaches almost the precision recall AUC when the data is fully labeled. So this scenario that we created shows that federated learning with active learning can detect new attacks uh, in which, um, which were not available in training at any of the participating clients. So no client had labels on any of this malware. And in the end, we are still able to detect them using this anomaly detection uh, component part of active learning. Um, so as for port filer here, we had um, several attack recreation exercises. We had three experiments where the UVA team ran live malware on the two networks. Um, experiments one and two are similar uh, to a slightly larger in scale. Experiment three um, is designed to, to model an evasive malware. In experiment three, both the domain and IP address of the C2 server change over time. And we trained the federated model on experiment one using either three days, six days, or 10 days. And then we evaluated on all the three experiments. So some observations from this table are that more training data um, increases the precision recall AUC. Um, experiment one and two are similar uh, as expected. Uh, experiment three is more evasive, so the precision recall AUC is lower, but still we can detect the malware C2 communication with reasonable success, even in the evasive scenario. So finally, we deployed the model in the two networks and we looked at the top 100 alerts um, identified. And what we found is that the majority of them were attack recreation, exercises like 59 out of 100, top 100 logs were attack recreation. Um, some number of them, 19 out of top 100, were alerts confirmed by a network intrusion detection system. Uh, the interesting part is that the system can detect new malware. We have a set of 12 URLs at UVA and 30 URLs at Virginia Tech, um, which were confirmed as malicious by virus total. And these are new, new malicious activities. Uh, precision of the system is quite high, um, 0.96 in top 50 alerts, uh, and top 0.9 in top 100 alerts. And the false positive rates are fairly low. This is a strict requirement for uh, systems deployed in, in production. So to summarize uh, what I talked about today, uh, we discussed two systems for uh, where we used AI for threat detection. The first one is Portfiler, an enterprise level defense system. Uh, Portfiler uses unsupervised learning to learn traffic profiles per port and then detect and rank anomalies. Uh, we have a novel ensemble method um, that is resilient against evasion. Uh, the second system is Celeste, a global level cyber defense system using federated learning uh, for collaborative uh, cyber defense. We have two novel components here, a semantics aware feature representation of HTTP logs using federated NLP models and an active learning component for enhancing the ground truth and adding more malicious activities. 
Uh, both systems have high precision recall AUC, low false positive rate, and they detected new malicious activities confirmed with virus dot. So at the beginning of the talk, I mentioned five challenges of using AI in cybersecurity. And now I would like to come back and discuss how we were able to address them. So the first one was the limited ground truth and the large data imbalance. And in our work, we used unsupervised learning in Profiler and active learning in Celeste to enhance the ground truth of malicious activities. Um, we use a variety of malicious data for validation, including public malware traces and attack recreation exercises. Uh, the second challenge was that we cannot share security data uh, on the internet because of the privacy consideration. So we, we propose the use of federated learning for training global models. Uh, third, uh, how do we capture semantics in cyber data? We propose the use of NLP methods for generating semantic aware log representation of HTTP logs. Fourth, there is a high cost of errors. So for this, we used ranking and prioritization to reduce false positives and increase precision. And we use global sharing of information for timely attack detection to reduce false negatives and increase recall to detect more attacks. And lastly, uh, the resilience of um, of ML against advanced adversary. So here we have just scratched the surface looking at um, resilience against evasion. In port pilot, we had this idea of using ensembles, but uh, there are many open problems in this space and much more work to be done to make ML resilient against attacks. And to elaborate a little bit on this last challenge, um, there are many attacks uh, shown in adversarial machine learning. The most common ones are poisoning attacks. These are attacks at training time when the attacker has some control over the training data. And then evasion attacks are a deployment time when the attacker can modify a testing sample to create an adversarial example that bypasses the detection. Um, and there is a lot of work on adversarial machine learning in computer vision, NLP, and other domains. Uh, here I am including references only for uh, attacks in cybersecurity, uh, including our own work, which is involved on the slide. And, and, and as you can see, there is much more work on attacks than on defenses. And the, the existing defenses that have been proposed, they have various limitations or trade-offs. Um, for example, uh, using things like randomized smoothing um, provides robustness at the expense of loss in accuracy and using adversarial training um, induces a large computational overhead. And so creating resilient AI for cybersecurity is really challenging and it's a problem that as a community we need to address and we need to put more work to to increase the resilience of AI in cybersecurity. So with that, I would like to acknowledge our entire team uh, at Northeastern and UVA, uh, part of the DARPA Chase program, all the students, the research scientists and faculty uh, who work very hard on this. And without their contributions, this work would not have been possible. And lastly, I would like to, to acknowledge all the funding agencies and companies that support my research. And I'm happy to take questions and also continue the conversation offline on any of these topics. So thank you very much for the opportunity to present. Thank you so much, Alina. And uh, we do indeed have about 10 minutes for questions. So I'm happy to bring anybody on. Feel free to raise your hand or ask your question in the chat. Um, while we wait, I do have a few questions for you. Uh, oh, okay, sure. First of all, I'm curious if you're aware of any initiatives ongoing to build more training sets of labeled malicious data and what kind of technical expertise is required on the part of the labelers? Um, and then is that wasted effort considering how dynamic the, the, the nature of the attacks will be? Yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah, I mean, 
um, as a community, I think we are lacking in, in benchmarks, right? And a lot of research is done in industry or in academic groups that collaborate with industry and they get access to data. And the reason is that the data cannot be shared, you know, on the on the internet. Um, now, creating labels, you're mentioning about labels, that might not be the hardest problem. I think the, the hardest problem is getting representative data, right? Like collecting, let's say, network traffic from users and publishing that on the internet. I don't think uh, anyone can get IRB approval for that, right? Now, on the other hand, uh, generating malicious traces, I think that doesn't have the same privacy concern. And so I think we can make progress on that. And you are right that the attacks are dynamic, but I think, you know, we can, we can probably keep up with like the latest attacks and, you know, we can create a virtual environment where we can deploy malware and then collect and label the traces. And this is part of the effort that was done at Virginia with the attack recreation exercises it's exactly that but these are quite require quite a, a, a large amount of effort right and human like expertise security expertise and you really have to be careful how to control the malware so it doesn't propagate on the internet on the, or in fact you know a user machine but this, these things have been done then there are uh, you know that there is expertise in the security community. So I think on the attack side, we can probably improve at least there we can get benchmarks. But uh, the issue on the sort of normal data background traffic that is a little bit more complicated because of privacy. Recently, there has been some efforts on using generative models like GANs to generate synthetic data that looks like normal data. So there could be a promise to, to follow those uh, you know, direction, and uh, that will have maybe less privacy concerns. Makes sense. And given those challenges, it, all the more reason we need to invest in the federated learning approach that you've demonstrated today. So we do have another question from uh, Dennis. Dennis, I'm offering you uh, unmuted. So go ahead and ask your question, please. Uh, first, Elena, thank you for an uh, excellent and timely, timely uh, presentation. Um, my interest is is very much in the recognition that there are lots of kinds of evasion. We're not at the end of that that kind of malbehavior. Uh, there are also many, many kinds of mitigation and remediation that you might conduct in response to a detection. Do you see any prospect or an improved prospect of with uh, uh, federated learning getting uh, better explainability, better interpretability to inform our ability to to act? Um, in response to detection? Yeah, yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah, that's a great question. So I think you, you touched on multiple things like interpretability. I think that's a major, you know, issue that we need to address. If these systems were to be used by human analysts, we need to think more or to think deeper about interpretability. And it's very well known that this uh, especially deep learning methods are not, in, not, not interpretable by design, right? And so federated learning doesn't necessarily address this issue because we're still training neural networks in a federated way, right? But it doesn't help us with the interpretability issue. So I think that has to be addressed and that's an important concern for cybersecurity. Um, and then the evasion is the is the other thing you mentioned. Yeah, so I think robustness and interpretability are you know, two main main issues that, uh, you know, have to be addressed. And there is ongoing research, I think, in the community, how to address them, but uh, things that techniques specifically designed for cyber, I think those would be very useful, right? Not the, just the generic methods uh, from computer vision or NLP. I see Ricardo, you've come on camera. Would you like to? Take over for your final question. I have a question myself. Um, so, uh, so thank you, Alina, a great, great presentation. One thing that I, I, I may be useful for all the people attending is that uh, your application is very imbalanced streaming data, or maybe the stream imbalanced data that you can find. And there are many other cases where it's important too, like health and other applications where, where you have this imbalance. What are your learnings about that? Is it's a matter of uh, using the right technique or is a lot of data dependence? How, what you can tell us about what you're learning in trying to solve this problem? Um, 
um, yeah, I mean, th th this is uh, kind of unique to cybersecurity, the fact that we have, you know, imbalance, especially with uh, the attack data, right? And we don't have enough representative attacks. And even if we did, the attack would evolve, right? We have this continuous evasion, basically, that the attackers evolve. And so there is a combination of imbalance and evasion that makes this really hard, right? And yeah, I think we have to, to look for models that support this imbalance. Uh, we have to look for the right metrics to evaluate. Like we still see papers in cybersecurity plotting rockers, and I don't think that's the right thing to do with a highly imbalanced situation. Um, okay, thank you. So we, I think we have one more question, Joe. Yeah, thank you. If you don't mind, one more question as oh, we sure. approach the end. Um, from, from the perspective of a university, say, uh, in terms of the network infrastructure, how quickly can an, uh, a malicious IP address be quarantined after detection? And then two-part question, if I may, more broadly, yes. beyond just making sure that all the websites are using a secure HTTP, what are some basic steps that uh, university administrators can take to secure their networks? Yeah, those are broad questions. Yeah, thank you very much for asking them. So regarding the mitigation, right, the first question is about, let's say we detect some like IP that's uh, malicious, what are we going to do, right? And I mean, for example, in our um, DARPA demos, we, we have implemented very simple mitigation, like setting up a firewall rule on the fly, right, and blocking uh, connection to this C2. IP, right? If we identify this is the command and control server, we have to have fairly high confidence, I would say, in order to implement the blocking, right? Because you don't want to affect legitimate users' traffic. So there are things like this that, that you can do. Um, there are other things like looking at access control policies or creating some isolation in the network, but those are more expensive. Um, and regarding the, the second question, what can an university do uh, to to protect its network, uh, well, this is a tough one, right? So there are lots of things like using, you know, antivirus, like fairly basic stuff, which will not, you know, protect you against everything, but at least let's say the very common threat, right? You would be, you would be protected against. Um, so things like, uh, again, yeah, using uh, antivirus, using, you know, two-factor authentication for like, connecting to the, to the VPN, you know, standard security settings. But in addition to, to using those, I think that monitoring the networks, right? That, that's kind of what I'm advocating through, through my research is to, to monitor the, the border of, of the campus network or the enterprise network and prioritize these alerts and employ teams of, um, you know, SOC analysts to look at the data. And it's a continuous hunt, right? Because no matter how many tools you deploy, there will still be things that bypass the existing methods, right? And so um, you need to look continuously, monitor, you know, the environment. Thank you so much. Th thank you, Alina, the perfect timing. We are just on time to end. So thank you, Alina, for a great presentation. And, and let me invite you to the continuation of this series on, in September. So we have Beth Novak talking about AI and society in the middle of September. And our first distinguished speaker will be Gary Marcus at the end of September talking about the limitations of deep learning. So we expect to see you again in September. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much.